Welcome back everybody. We're going to start with unit number nine, which is a, more of a inward focus on the security team itself. We've been looking at how we interact with other people, both internally from our, you know, our partners in the ESRM model. And last week we looked at external partners and primarily the local police, because that will be the majority of interactions that a security manager will have at least early in their career. And uh, I hope you found that to be an interesting subject, uh, especially the fact that the the police and security don't always get along as well as one might think. The uh, the impressions of each other sometimes are a little bit, uh, well, they're wrong in most cases, let's, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, you need to understand the lay of the land before you start to form those relationships so you can understand what model you want to operate in and how you want that relationship to be focused. This week we're going to talk about the security team itself and your own internal team. And um, there's just a couple of uh, things we want to focus on really. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about composition of team, but for the most part, how you would set up a security team and some of the things, and there's so many factors, we, we could spend months on this, but uh, there's just a few factors that I really want to drive home so that you understand when you start to set up a security team, if indeed you go somewhere where you're starting fresh, some of the things you might want to think about. When we talk about the security team, we're going to talk about the components, the different functions and roles and responsibilities of those who make up the security team. And again, we're going to talk generally about that, you know, that mid-sized for-profit company. Um, and there are some, some variances, obviously, when you have really large companies or you have very small or nonprofits. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about the uh, security team at a mid-sized company for our model and for our discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about the impact of mission and size. You know, as I mentioned, you know, big companies can be different, but mission also has an impact on how you set up a security team. Uh, the composition of that team, whether it's proprietary or contract or some hybrid of the two, is a very important decision that you'll need to make at some point. And uh, it's not always cut and dried about, uh, you know, that the, the best employees are proprietary and contractors you get what you pay for, which is kind of a, a mantra. Um, but there are some interesting uh, realities about setting up that team in the right way. And one of those is liability shifting, which I want to get into very specifically. So a straw man security team. A straw man is something that, uh, if you haven't used the term before in business, uh, when you set up something for a discussion, you say, here's my straw man, here's how I think it should look. And then the group that you're you're working with, the team that's looking at something, can knock down the straw man and rebuild it in any way they see fit. But you're starting with something really for the purposes of discussion. And our site-based model is going to include a security manager or security leader, some shift leaders or shift supervisors, some guards, an administrator or an administration function within security, system support, and non-security partners, which are very important, especially when you're building your team, you understand what non-security partners are available to you so you can get them on the cheap. So the security manager, the job that many of you in this major at least aspire to uh, and beyond, uh, sets the vision, the goals, the strategies, and tactics. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with strategies versus tactics, strategies are your long-term plans, the big items that you want to accomplish, the big things that you want to get close to your vision and goals. And the tactics are the smaller little pieces that you use to put it together. Think of uh, strategy as being a jigsaw puzzle and the tactics being the puzzle pieces. And in the end, you use your tactics to build your strategies. Um, you're the senior budget manager for the security function. So you're responsible for the buying and the, the um, financial things we talked about in unit three or four, I believe. Um, you're also the ESRM subject matter expert. We've gone over ESRM and you understand that the ESRM program is owned by everyone, but you are the subject matter expert as the manager. You're the liaison to senior leadership on security matters. So if there's anything having to do with security, if there's a security incident, a security concern, senior leadership is going to call that security manager directly uh, as their pipeline to be their subject matter expert. You lead the security team that we're going to talk about. You determine the protection plan. So with the ESRM model, you go through and then you set up a protection plan based on those risks that are identified and the mitigations that are identified, you build that protection plan. That includes the staffing that's required to make your facility secure. And then you uh, get metrics and metrics are measures. They are um, numbers, really statistics on number of incidents and how you handled them and where they went and how serious they were. Um, there's any number of metrics, uh, you know, how, how often people leave the company. So you know what your tenure is. So you know what the the training needs to be done, how often people are trained in security. There's a number of metrics and you get those and analyze those and then you can act on them. So a good metric might be um, 
security training is done once per year. But if you find out that you have turnover at your company where the entire staff turns over every six months, then you know your metric of security training once a year. You may want to change that to once every three months, every four months, so that everyone is constantly security trained. So you'll get those metrics and you'll do the analysis and make some business decisions based on those. So shift leaders are one step down, if you will, on the hierarchy if you're using a, a organizational chart from the security manager. They normally report to the security manager and they lead a subset of the team. I've called them shift leaders here. They could be a site leader as well if you have multiple sites under one security manager. So it could be a shift or geography. For our discussion, we'll go with, with shifts. But they're responsible for ensuring that the standards that are set by that security manager are done, completed for their area of responsibility, or AOR. They are the first stage really to triage incidents when they happen on their shift. So a security officer comes across a car in the parking lot that is running with its doors open and no one's around, they would normally call that shift leader and that shift leader makes a determination. Do we run the license plate if we have that available to us? Do we shut the car off? Do we look inside? Do we you know, do a search around? Um, do we know who the car belongs to? Do we go get them? Do we call the police? The shift leader normally makes that determination in our model of that mid-sized company. They implement the protection plan. They have some input normally because they can come back and be very valuable tools to the security manager to say, you wanted to mitigate the risk this way, so you have us do a certain thing, and in doing so, you opened up a whole nother risk. Um, so when they implement the plan, they're a very good um, sounding board for your security plan and be able to tell you great things about it. But they implement the plan you give them. They normally provide for some stability because shift supervisors, shift leaders, even in the contracted model, the turnover is much less because the pay is normally more. So they provide for stability when you have a constantly changing guard force or other changes in your organization. Those shift leaders are normally relatively stable. They stick around for a while and they provide that stability. And they look for the quality control on metrics. So if you're looking at metrics on how many incidents did you have of theft in the last month at your facility, um, you may find that the security officers are classifying a single instance of theft as two thefts. So a person had a picture frame and a coffee cup stolen off their desk in their office. They do two separate reports. Why they did it, we don't know. But the shift leader would catch that and say, no, this is a single incident with two missing items. Let's, let's fix that so that when you go to look at the metrics on how many incidents you had, you had one incident and your metrics then are more valuable to you because you make better business decisions with cleared data coming at you, right? So now we have the guards, which are generally considered the lowest portion of the manned uh, security element. Although uh, you have to remember that the guards are your number one customer interface. You are not going to see every person, if you are the security manager for a mid-sized company, you are not going to go face to face with every person that comes in the front door every day. And your shift supervisors won't do that because they work various shifts. But that guard in the main lobby where people come in to work, we'll see them every day. So they are your customer interface. So it, it, it's kind of ironic that the person who is going to be seen most by your customer base, the impression they may have of your security organization is going to come from the person who is lowest on the hierarchy when it comes to the organizational chart. They implement post orders and directives. Uh, you take your, your protection plan and you translate that into post orders. So if I want to make sure that everyone has an ID available to them when they come in the door and where's that ID, then I have a post order that says that the security officer will ensure that everyone runs their access badge, perhaps on a reader coming in the door, that everyone will then put that on and wear it in a certain way. And there will be a post order for how to challenge people when they don't do that or when you see them in the hallway and they've taken it off. So your plan would say that Everyone must wear a badge, and then your post orders would say, how are you going to enforce that? And that's what the guards are going to use for their um, documentation and their learning to, to move your plan forward. Generally, guards observe and report. They do respond, <clears throat> but generally they observe and report. And if they see something that is out of the, uh, the norm, they would report that to a shift supervisor who would then do that triage. They populate the metrics. So they're the people who are providing the metrics to you that you'll make decisions on. How many parking tickets did they write in the last month? If you know that they wrote a lot of parking tickets because people don't have a place to park and you investigate that metric and find out it's because you have 500 employees and 400 parking spaces, then perhaps you need to report that to the engineering lead or to uh, HR, uh, come up with some sort of plan for people to park. So those are the type of metrics that they would populate for you. 
Um, they also do monitoring. Normally, a guard is the person who's doing alarm monitoring and camera monitoring at a site. They sit in a control room at a mid-sized site and monitor, so that's normally a guard function. And then other tasks as assigned, and that can range in a lot of different directions. I've had facilities where guards are responsible for shoveling around turnstiles where people come in on a fence line uh, and putting salt out when it's slippery um, for notifying uh, uh, engineering when there are belts that are making noises when they're doing appointed rounds, if you will. So there are other tasks assigned to guards and you can get some great value from those ESRM partners by doing little things during the guards round that they would normally have to do themselves or have someone tasked to do and pay overtime. Uh, always look for those, but to those other tasks as assigned can really be a benefit to you as well. And then the guards tend to actually like them because it keeps them awake. So if you're fortunate enough to have an administration function in a mid-sized company, then that's a great thing for you. I recommend it highly as something that would make your organization much more uh, effective and efficient. Um, that person normally would be the one who puts the badges into a badge access system. I call it badge access, it's actually access control systems because it could be facial recognition, fingerprints, any number of, of biodigital um, type devices. But they normally populate that system and hand out the credentials so people can get it in and out. They would do key control and maybe even parking passes, uh, awareness materials. So when someone you know needs a uh, some information on uh, you know security awareness, they would go see that administrative person and they would have canned materials that they could share. They compile the metrics for you. It's really a function of just putting the metrics into you know charts and graphs and things that are easily understood so you can make business decisions. They often act as the administrative assistant to the department, but that's not always true. And in some cases, you may use someone from the guard force provider, if you've contracted that, to provide this function. And they may also uh, be sitting up a post while they do some of this. So they could be the receptionist in a, you know, a rear entry lobby area for employees only, but they're also making badges and entering data uh, as a combined kind of function. Uh, they do sometimes the coordination, and I've had this done many times. They coordinate the ESRM process for me. They're not the subject matter expert. We're talking about making sure that uh, everyone gets any materials they need prior to ESRM meetings, taking the information back and compiling it into spreadsheets so that I can use that to start to rank and order my risk. So, you know, it's nice to have some administrative help when you can get it. And it's kind of a combination of security administration and normal administrative assistant work. If you can get that, um, again, that's something you ought to think about. See if you can afford in your budget because it's very helpful to your, to your organization. And you have system support. And that's normally uh, when you have a little bit high tech, more of a smart building in some cases. But most buildings now have some form of access control, even if it's just keys. Um, you would have someone who would do the repair and install of access control, video surveillance systems, intrusion detection slash alarm systems. Uh, they would maintain metrics on the system life and repair. And that may be a regulatory item where you have to show how often you do preventative maintenance on, on systems. Um, and so that person would be responsible for hanging out to those metrics. And those are really important to you when it comes to your capital budget. Uh, if you see in the metrics they send you that they are repairing a certain piece of equipment three and four times a month, then it's probably time for you to consider putting in your capital plan for next year, replacing that piece of equipment so you can use this person's time more effectively. So system lifecycle and repair records are hugely important to preparing that capital budget we talked about in the finance unit. Um, they also may be a shared resource. So this could be someone who works on security equipment, but if you don't have a lot of it, they could also work on the fire systems, building automation, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, which is what HVAC stands for. You'll see that used in industry a lot. So just remember that. Uh, communications, all kinds of other systems. They could be the locksmith for the site and work on door hardware, just in, including locks, um, but also things like hinges and uh, handles and the types of things that aren't really security devices per se. But it may be a shared resource. Um, don't, uh, don't shun that idea because uh, if you can spread that cost out amongst uh, yourself and someone else, then that's more budget you have for other things. And last but not least, you'll have partners. And by partners, I mean that you are going to partner with other people internally in your company to get things done. So again, that, uh, that engineering person who might work on some of your security equipment uh, but also works on the door hardware. Well, if you can get him trained as a locksmith, then he belongs to your engineering department. You have a built-in locksmith that you don't have to pay for. 
IT support. You, you know, most companies will have several people now in an IT department because we are becoming more of a, a digital uh, environment in business. And so you wouldn't go out normally and hire your own IT person because you're going to rely on the one that's there. Accounting, um, you know, you're going to do your own budget, but you're not going to do your own accounts payable, right? You're not going to uh, to write out checks to the vendors that you use yourself. You have an accounting department that does that. So what I want you to be cognizant of is that not everything you do is done by you. There are other partners available in your business. You should use them, use them wisely, use them widely. Um, if someone else will pay the bill for a function and it, the function will get done, you should always do that first. Save your budget, keep your powder dry for things you really need. So what could make this, uh, this model change in flux? Well, lots of stuff. Um, the mission of your, of your organization. If there are regulatory needs, um, let's just say that in the nuclear uh, arena, you must have two people at every entry point and they have to be armed, which means you're going to need twice as many people and you're going to need to have potentially an armorer uh, who's going to hand out the weapons and maintain the weapons and clearing barrel, barrel officials for people when they bring their weapons back, when they come off post, they have to empty those and put them, put them back empty, right? So the size uh, um, of your contingent and the different roles that you have may vary widely if you have big regulatory needs, if you have armed versus unarmed, you'll have extra, extra um, people that you'll need in different roles. Um, if you have entry controlled versus public access properties, we talked about that last week with a shopping mall. Shopping mall is private property, has private security, but it's public access. Anybody can come in when the mall is open and walk around. That definitely will impact the type of, of roles that you have. You may want to have more than one uh, shift slash uh, area supervisor uh, to handle each floor of a shopping mall if it's extremely busy, like Mall of America. Um, and your core business focus, obviously, if you are a chemical plant, if you are a nuclear plant, if you are, um, you know, a medical uh, center, you will have different uh, needs potentially than someone who has a standard commercial business, uh, like an office building uh, that has the need for entry control people in the lobby and some patrol people and an administrator and a security manager. You may have the need in your core business to have people who do many other things. Um, trying to think of an example in an emergency room you may have someone who simply stands in the emergency room and waits for someone to act up you may need to have those extra patrols and they need to be specially trained so your mission is going to impact it and of course your size and your staffing should be scalable when you set up your organization you should be able to make it bigger or smaller if your company gets bigger or smaller without changing it too much but in a larger facility you could have economies of scale so um, if I have one entry to my facility, and my facility is 10,000 square feet, I need one entry person in the lobby, the receptionist. If that becomes 50,000 square feet or 200,000 or a million square feet, I may still only need one reception person in the lobby. There's an economy of scale there. But if it's occupied versus unoccupied space, if that million square foot building is occupied during the day, I may need less people during the day because we have our employees walking around. They're going to tell me if there's a fire, if there's a flood. But at night, when no one's there, I may need more people walking around to detect for fires and floods and the types of things that the guards may come across in an unoccupied building. So economies of scale, um, sometimes you'll, you'll get away with more. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have more space, more square footage with the same amount of people. But when it's occupied versus unoccupied, uh, could change. So size has an impact on your your setup and your size of your security contingent. So now we've talked about the the standard model, if you will, for that mid-sized company we set up with the different roles and responsibilities and what we need done. And uh, we've got it all scalable so that if the place gets bigger, we know what we're going to do. And if it gets smaller, we know what we're going to do. All those great things. Now let's talk about the composition of that team. And by composition, I mean, where do you get the people to do these jobs? And in the security model, there are several ways to do this. There's a contracted model, which is leased employees, and it's normally through a security service provider. So think about in the U.S. we have, if you look around, you'll see uh, Securitas a lot. You'll see G4S or SecureCore around a lot. You'll see Allied Universal around a lot. There are some really large companies. There are some regional ones. Um, 
I'm sure there's one in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm not aware of who they are because I don't do any operations there. But um, in the Midwest, you have uh, Wayland Security. In the South, you have um, uh, SFI. <clears throat> and there's a number of regional um, players in this as well. But they are leased employees. They're not yours. You essentially buy the service from a security provider, and they provide the people and the equipment and the uh, um, the liability insurance and everything that you need. In a proprietary model, these are in-house employees, and you direct hire them. Less common in the U.S. Uh, normally, it's a, a a mixture or it's a contracted model, but there are places. Um, I know um, um, certain biological facilities in the U.S. have nothing but their own security. There are others that have just had it for years and years and years. Uh, locally, where I live, Steelcase is a major employer, and they have their own Steelcase security contingent. These are in-house employees, and they get the same pay benefits and work for the exact same company as everyone else on the line. Uh, but it normally requires a lot more people because you have to train and equip and lead these people yourself. So you're not, you can't buy any of those things. Essentially, you have to provide them yourself. Now, in a hybrid model, which is common in a larger setting, larger companies, uh, you have some that are contracted and some that are in-house. Uh, normally, it is the uh, more skilled people who are um, the in-house employees. <clears throat> so your security manager, uh, perhaps your shift leaders would be in-house employees. But it can be inverted as well. And that's becoming more and more popular where the chief security officer of a company is a contracted person, and there still may be in-house guards at the guard level who have been there forever. Um, and so they're, they're doing a transition to a contracted model where you have the chief security officer as a contractor and the people below him are in-house employees. And uh, I, I can think of Perigo, which is the world's largest manufacturer of generic over-the-counter drugs. Um, you know, when you pick up uh, a bottle of aspirin that just says aspirin on it at the, at the Walgreens or the Duane Reed or CVS, it is most likely made by Perigo. Their chief security officer was a contractor for a very, very long time, and some of the guards were still proprietary. Um, that's an inverted model. It's not as common, but it's becoming more common. Um, I'm not really sure why. It could be a cost issue, but it is becoming more common. Um, but hybrid models also have co-employment issues, and we'll talk about co-employment in a bit. Um, but uh, they're the model that probably works best, in my opinion, I mean, I could be wrong and the situation dictates, but I think it works best, but it also has some of the most um, uh, trap doors in it that can get you into trouble. So co-employment being the big one, and we'll talk a little bit about that. One of the big decisions, though, in deciding whether you have a contracted uh, force or a totally proprietary force or some sort of hybrid on your security team is liability. And you can shift liability in some cases to others, which is a good thing, but you can't make it go away. Um, so use of force and discrimination. Um, let's just say that you have a contracted guard force and you are the security manager. You're an in-house direct hire employee to the company and so are your shift leaders. And one of your guards uh, gets in an argument with someone who says they don't want to show their ID at the, at the gate. And instead of calling the shift supervisor and just you know keeping the gate closed, the guard arm closed so the person can't go anywhere, the security guard reaches in the car and grabs at the person to try to get their badge away from them. That's a use of force violation. <clears throat> in most cases, if you have a contracted guard, liability, if the person should s decide to sue, would go back to that guard company. They are an employee of the guard company. The guard company is responsible for their training, and use of force is a common training item in security. And your liability then for the company would be shifted back to that guard company. If it were a proprietary guard and you were responsible for training them, then the company could be directly sued. And they still could be sued, but you're, you've got some, some recourse when you have shifted the liability to a contractor and have a strong contract in place. Discrimination being you know, the same thing. If a guard discriminates against someone and doesn't allow them into an area based on a protected class, and it's a contracted guard, uh, human relations is a common training item for contracted guard companies, and the guard company then would take on the vast majority of the liability. Same with delinquent hiring, wrongful termination, meaning the guard themselves. If the guard company hires a guard who had a felony conviction for, uh, let's say, criminal sexual conduct, and that guard makes an inappropriate uh, physical advance to someone, 
at the company. Uh, it is very likely the guard company could be sued for delinquent hiring, but the company would have some standing to say they were not our employee. We have a contract that says that the guard company will indeed do a full background check and not you know, put someone who has criminal sexual history uh, into our facility. Therefore, you know, we are, we've shifted that liability to the guard company. Um, but failure to perform normally goes both ways. So if you ask the guards to, you know, make sure that there is no standing water on the floors and part of their, um, those other tests is assigned are to mop up after a spill or to identify hazards in the workplace and you've trained them in that and they miss it, the company can't shift liability in those cases. So there are, liability shifting is, is limited. And oftentimes security managers will say, well, I'm going to go with a contracted guard force because I don't want to take on any of the liability. Let them take it. And it's really not an absolute. And, um, and it's a situation dictates kind of thing. You really need to understand that when you shift the liability to the guard company, it is only the direct actions of the guard that they've been trained on that really you can shift any kind of liability. For the most part, it's, um, it's a matter of, of shared liability and you're spreading it out a little bit, but you don't make it go away. So a fully contracted model and the entire security function from the chief security officer to the guard positions are contracted and the contractor firm handles everything. They do the ESRM program and interviews and worked with your in-house uh, um, people to, to do that risk assessment and plan. They supply all the equipment, including uniforms and flashlights and communications equipment and vehicles. They supply everything, even have control over the uh, access control and camera systems uh, and alarm systems. They handle everything. It is a true turnkey operation. And if you remember what we call the turnkey operation was, it's contracted, but you're writing one check. You are saying you handle everything having to do with this program. And I know there's some confusion in one of the uh, quizzes. Uh, a turnkey operation is a contracted uh, operation. It is a contracted project. However, the difference being is that a contracted uh, project could be handled in bits and pieces. So I'm going to build a house. That is my project. And if I hire the builder and the plumber and the electrician separately, and I, I hire them individually myself, that is a contracted project. If I hire a building company and say, I'm going to write you one check for $400,000 and I want you to build me this house, and they hire all the rest of those people, then that's a turnkey. I write one check to one person to return one project. And in fully contracted models, it is turnkey. It can be costly, but core business is an important thing. Most companies don't want to be in the security business if that's not their business, right? If you are building, um, if you're making baseball bats in a factory, you want to concentrate on, you know, making the best baseball bat you can, buying great lumber to do this, having high speed lathes and having the things come out the same every time, a great product that goes and is used in Major League Baseball. Um, you don't want to be in the security business too. So it can be costly, but it also allows you to just say that part of my business is taken care of. And it's best for liability shifting because you have normally a solid contract that says you're handling everything. Therefore, you're responsible for everything with the exception of those few things that are shared. Like we said, the, you know, some of the hazards and the facilities things, most of the liability will shift to that contractor. The proprietary team is all direct hired. So the chief security officer, the security managers, if there's a separation between the two, and in some cases there will and won't be, uh, the guards, the, the systems person, the administrator, everyone is a direct employee of the company. And that means the company has to go out and purchase uniforms if uniforms are used. And in most cases, they are either used or they may be legally required. They have to purchase all the equipment. <clears throat> if, uh, if your guards at night need to have flashlights, then you're going to buy flashlights and batteries and make sure you've got plenty of them are available training materials and delivery of training to the guards. You'll have to be responsible for that use of force training and the hazard identification training and everything else you want them to do. You have to do that training. You have to make sure that they, you have insurance to cover the guards for errors and omissions and the types of uh, liability that guards take on. Um, licensing in many uh, case, uh, states is required. In fact, uh, some states and some counties separate from the states you have to have a guard license and you're responsible for making sure that that's up to date. You can't tell your contractor, make sure everybody's licensed and call it good. You have to physically keep copies and make sure that they're up to date, make sure everybody keeps their license good. 
physical clearance is the same way. If uh, a guard company provides someone and they can't come to work because they, um, they can't breathe in chemicals, perhaps uh, at the plant where you're doing painting, you know, you're going to paint these baseball bats, so you're using spray paint, and the guard gets sick, they provide another guard. In your case, you would need to put that person on a medical release and go find a backup person to do that, do that job. Full liability comes to the company. Full hiring of people to support the program comes to the company. A trainer, uh, more shift supervisors perhaps. It gets very, very expensive. You do have full control. Control is a great thing. But then you also have full liability, and you can't shift it really to anyone else. It belongs to you. So proprietary, although you have full control, and for some people that's an important thing, you also take on full responsibility and liability, which can hurt you in the long run. It's pretty hard to do a full proprietary without a huge guard force and a huge budget. Which is why most people go to a hybrid model. So rather than the contracted model where you have no control over it and you've just gotten totally away from it, you write a check and it's done and you have no control. And usually that means that there could be problems. You sometimes in full contract models, you see that uh, you get taken advantage of full proprietary model. You've got all the control and you've got all the headache. A hybrid model gives you a little bit of both. So you generally have your more skilled uh, positions and roles as proprietary your security manager, your shift leads. Your guards in a less skilled normally um, position are contracted. Your administrator could go either direction depending on what tasks you give that person to do or those people to do if there's more than one. The only difference really is in the systems where it comes, you know, the, the more skilled you need, the more likely you are to contract that. And that's because systems are changing so rapidly that you really need to contract for someone who has the most up-to-date knowledge to do very complex systems work, whereas the more routine stuff could be done uh, by someone that's there every day. So normally, uh, if you're going to have a hybrid, your systems person is the uh, person with the lower skill level and you contract for higher skill levels. Um, but in the other positions, the reverse is true. Higher skill level is normally in-house, lower skill level is normally contracted. Very common in large organizations, it's touted as a cost savings um, because again, you know, the proprietary model being hugely expensive, the contracted being expensive as well because you're giving full control, so you've got to pay a full price. This hybrid allows you to control costs a little better, but I will tell you that normally it's touted as a big cost savings. It's not always a meaningful impact when it comes to cost. Uh, I have seen hybrid organizations that cost as much as proprietary and as much as, as fully contracted. And if you're going to save any money at all, it's really not... I mean, I guess if you're really looking for pennies, you're in good shape, but I have not seen them uh, in my experience and in the experience of others. And, and the literature that I've read really doesn't uh, show that savings is there. Uh, there's mixed loyalty. Um, contract people tend to have less loyalty to your company because they don't work for your company. They work for their own company, and they seldom have much loyalty to them because they're assigned to your facility, so they relate to your facility but they also know they're not an employee there. So there's this kind of a um, uh, mixed loyalty, especially when there's no clear path to transition. So when you have contracted, especially guards, that understand that even though there's a proprietary security manager, maybe a proprietary administrator and shift leads, if there's not a clear path to transition where if I'm here for 10 years and that shift lead leaves, I'm probably going to be the next guy in line, um, you find that the loyalty level is, is pretty low. And then there are co-employment concerns, and we need to talk about co-employment. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, it can get you in a lot of trouble and um, can cost you a lot of money. So let's go talk about that. When you have contracted employees that come to your facility every day and work in your facility 40 hours a week and sometimes for decades, they tend to assimilate so much into the company that it is a little bit foggy as to whether they're employees or whether they're contractors. And in some cases, they have claimed that they were brought into the company, they performed the same duties, they were treated as an employee, they used the same cafeteria, they used the same gym, they were given you know, the same everything except for financial benefit, meaning pensions and 401k and medical benefits and those things. And they have sued companies to say, I was a contractor at company A. Company A treated me as if I was an in-house employee in every way, shape, or form except for giving me equal access to financial benefits. 
and it's been tested in court and it's met with mixed results but the, the i think the most famous case is a microsoft case from 2000 if i'm not mistaken where eight independent contractors sued microsoft claiming exactly as i said they were treated as in-house employees in every way shape or form given full control they actually supervised other people who were microsoft employees and therefore said we are not um, contractors we are de facto employees and they were by a california court granted um, back pay and benefits and it cost microsoft a, a fair amount of money to settle that and so co-employment then <clears throat> became a buzzword really in industry about how you treat contractors and the big thing is to make sure that every person acknowledges who their employer really is so in a contract with a contracted security company you need to make sure that they have everyone sign an acknowledgement that they work for that security company, not for their assigned company, no matter how long they spend there, that their pay and benefits and, and allowances come from solely from the security company and not from the company where they're assigned. And then you have to be very careful about how you, um, how you work with those folks. Having a contracted person directly supervise an in-house person can lead to a co-employment issue. Um, you know, inviting these people to company functions that normally would be reserved for employees only, the Christmas party, um, you know, going to conferences, paying directly for their training to travel places to do things can be a co-employment issue. You have to have a certain amount of separation. Um, one of the big things to remember with security companies, when you have contracted security people, they always want to talk about how little they are paid and they want to talk about it with you because as the in-house employee, they believe that you control their pay. In some ways you do. The amount you pay the guard company is going to affect how much the guard company pays them in most cases. But you cannot discuss pay, benefits, and allowances directly with contractors because that is a direct co-employment issue. It will get you sued. It will get you in trouble. So make sure you keep that separation and always refer contractors back to their contracted company. So as far as the lecture, that's it for this week. There's some reading. Um, what I, uh, I want, really want to impress on you with this uh, particular um, unit is that when you set up a security team, there are many ways to, to do that. There are different models. There are different ways to get your labor put together. You really need to understand your organization in order to do that. But hopefully with the information we cover here, you understand that you're not you know, strictly going to be a contracted security uh, um, user or a you have to set up your own organization and train everybody and you know get everybody up to speed and worry about whether they have flashlights and uniforms and your insurance is paid and those things there are ways to shift that liability and that work to others for a fee and companies normally will pay that fee and then to keep certain positions that you know are critical uh, that you want for more high level normally uh, planning type uh, positions in-house and use the uh, the contracted model as a tool uh, to to make a a uh, um, gosh a, a hybrid um, kind of a um, put together jigsaw puzzle type model, if you will, uh, so that all the pieces come together for your strategy. So again, you've done some reading. Lecture is done. Thank you. There's a quiz on this unit only. It is a ten question quiz. It is only on this unit. Um, it is going to be released on Wednesday at midnight, and it must be done by Sunday at midnight. I don't want to release it on Monday because then people do it and they rush through the lesson. And I have noticed that when I do that, people don't do as well on the quiz. I want you to take your time, do the reading, do the lecture, let it absorb, get a little time in to study it before you hit that quiz. I do want to talk really quick, uh, just a minute or two about the quiz and quizzes in general and the whole term of best answer. So here's a sample question. A military tank is A, a large metal object, B, a large metal vehicle, C, a large metal vehicle generally used in ground warfare, or D, a large metal, metal vehicle generally parked in front of a National Guard armory. Now, if you look at those, um, you could say that all of those are true, and that's a confusing question, but not if you look at it in terms of how you select a best answer. So we can say that all of them are correct. A tank is a big metal object, it's a big metal vehicle, it's a big metal vehicle used uh, for ground warfare, and it's a big metal vehicle generally parked in front of a, a National Guard armory, although that last one is suspect, and I'll tell you why. 
sense. The first one is true, but it also applies to lots of things. A tank is a large metal object. Okay, that's a true answer, but is it the best answer? A little better answer is a tank is a large metal vehicle because it's a little more specific. So if you were to tell me which is the best answer, the best way to describe a tank to someone, between those two answers, I would say it's a large metal vehicle is better than a large metal object. It rules out more things. Now, when you say it's a large metal vehicle, generally used in ground warfare, now that narrows it down to me. It rules out many other things. Now there are still some, you know, a cannon, um, you know, a, a, a large gun that you pull behind a vehicle, um, you know, jeeps and, and, you know, I'm an old military guy, so I go back to the jeep days, right, before the armored personnel carriers and the like that they have today, the Humvees. But um, that's a pretty specific uh, description of a tank. Now, saying that is a large metal vehicle generally parked in front of a National Guard armory, I would say, no, that's probably not true. Although they are parked sometimes in front of a National Guard armory. If you drive by one, you'll usually see a tank. The vast majority of tanks are not parked in front of National Guard armories, and I think we all know that. The vast number of tanks are either on a battlefield somewhere or staged somewhere to go to a battlefield. Uh, for those who have ever driven by a army uh, base, a large army base, uh, the one I think of most uh, frequently is Fort Riley, Kansas. When you drive by, you see just miles and miles of tanks and helicopters ready to go to war. Um, so the best answer here would be a tank is a large metal vehicle generally used in ground warfare because it is generally used in ground warfare. We know that to be true. Generally parked in front of a National Guard armory is sometimes true, but I wouldn't say generally true. And it is a large metal vehicle. It is better than the first two answers, and the last one is not always applicable. So we are looking for the best answer. And that sounds very complicated. Why can't it just be true, false, or, you know, read it back to me? Well, that's not how life works, gang. The best answer is true. It is most specific and most accurate. So of the answers we had there, three were true, one was partially true. The most specific got us down to the large metal vehicle used in ground warfare, and that is most accurate, where the last one wasn't most accurate because it's not always in front of a National Guard armory. And that included an item which may not be true. So we found our best answer that way. In real life, you seldom get one answer. You always choose the best answer. If someone sends you to the store and says, please go pick up some uh, cups for the party, Get some red solo cups for the party. And you know there are going to be three people at the party. You probably will not pick up a pack of 200 cups. If you know it is going to be a huge party, you will probably pick up two or three packs of the 200s. And you'll have plenty, right? The best answer was known to you based on other information. You're going to look at the, at the answers given, look at the information you have and the information you were given in those questions, and pick the best answer. If you read a question wrong, then you read it wrong. If most read it wrong, then I wrote it wrong. Let me say that again. If you read a question wrong, then you read it wrong. If most everybody in the class read it wrong, then I wrote it wrong. And I'll know that because I have the aggregate statistics on every question that I put out there. So far this term, I have eliminated two questions because the vast majority of people got those questions wrong. And I looked at them and said, okay, then in my estimation, it could have been misinterpreted to say this. Normally it's two factors. Most people missed the question and most people selected an answer that um, could possibly be true. So if most got it wrong and those who got it wrong all selected the same answer and got it wrong, then it's a suspect question to me and I have no trouble taking that out and giving everybody credit for it. But I have had a number of calls from students saying that a question is wrong, it was written wrong, they don't understand the question. When 95% of this class gets that question correct, then I would suggest you have to say that perhaps you're reading it wrong. And so um, I will eliminate questions in the future if indeed the vast majority get it wrong and those who got it wrong all select very, sim very similarly, at least the vast majority select a certain answer that could be correct, then I'll throw it out or I'll just accept either answer. But I guess I just want to make sure that everybody understands that when I say best answer, that is how life works. That is why I gear my quizzes that way. And, um, you know, if there's an issue with that, I 
be happy to discuss it further in general, but we're not going to discuss individual questions anymore and why they may or may not be correct. So after that long diatribe and lecture, um, call or write if you have questions or concerns, as always. Um, be sure you have the reading available for the quiz, and I will post this lecture. I didn't do it last week. Uh, I didn't see the need because we didn't really have a, a quiz on it, but I will post this lecture as a just a uh, unnarrated, unnarrated version in PowerPoint so that you can have it available and take notes on it. And as we go forward in the next few weeks, we're going to be putting everything together, pulling it all together, picking, taking pieces, as we kind of did this week with some of the finance stuff and, and some of the ESRM stuff and the partnering. We're going to start to put it all together to show how each one of those pieces that we've gone over fits together to make you a more rounded security manager in your career. With that, have a great week, and we will talk to you uh, probably during the week.